welcome. I'm Padmini Mittal and you're watching Storyboard's coverage of the 9th Curious Design Yatra. This week, we've lined up two interviews that shed light on where the communications business is headed. First up is Matt Heinel from British agency Moving Brands. Founded in 1998 for traditional print branding services, Moving Brands calls itself a global creative innovation agency which does everything from experience design to creating product prototypes. So, what's the agency's culture and how exactly do they help marketers? Storyboard editor Anand Rangaswamy finds out. Hello and thank you for talking to us. Well, it's all a pleasure to you be know, here. Uh, I was struck by that, the visual impact of that slide which had you know, seven circles almost, in your opinion, defining what your company did yep. and then zillions of post-its which defined what your colleagues thought the company did. <laughs> yeah. You know? yeah. And I think that captures the essence of this, yeah. of the complexity of this business today. Absolutely. I think uh, I'm glad you picked up on that one because it's been very interesting for me personally as well to see that because um, today, what I'm seeing a lot is that uh, on the on the let's say the agency side, many many agencies are starting to either move or realise they need to move into a situation where they understand at least about more than one silo or more than one production area, whatever their speciality might be. I think you can be fantastic at doing one thing brilliantly. And that will, there will always be people who do that. There's always going to be a space for that. But a company like ours is, has always been broad. I mean, you also saw at the beginning, the, the company started as a technology business that was doing satellite broadcasting in the Himalayas. And then they had a film production company and then it became into digital and branding and so forth. And it, so it's very natural for us to move between these spaces, but I'm seeing that that's becoming more and more normal uh, in other companies as well. And the other thing that's very interesting for me is that a lot of the time that we've been doing that, it's been hard for us to explain that to clients. What I'm seeing now is that that's what clients expect. This little bit of a conversation, it, it, it provokes me into worrying about what are you, how, what do you tell your clients when you, when you think of a client, whether it was an HP or a Stella McCart, what is it that you do? And how do you answer that question? Well, we talk about the, the, the thing that we give them or we work on is using creativity to help their business. It's not specifically design. It's not about visual outputs. Uh, it's not necessarily marketing. It's creative thinking and craft to support the business. But the areas that we're very strong in are in brand, and digital and experience design in the product. So we tend to get... It's, it's not that often where someone comes to us and says, I've never heard of you, tell me what you do. Right. What usually happens is they go, So what do you do? You're still not answering that yeah, question. I, well, we, you're asking, what do we do? No, if, I, if, I, if, I hope if, I answered that, but I think what go we to make the, is different. Right. Now, if we go to the, the old concept of the elevator pitch, so yeah. 30 seconds between ground floor <laughs> and the fifth floor, Impossible. and I ask you what you do, what happens? I th it's, it's hard. Right. It's, it's honestly hard and I think if I, pr if I tried to do it now, I've tried it many times and it doesn't quite work. Right. What we usually end up doing is saying, you know that one thing you've got an issue with or you see an opportunity, like that brand problem you've got? Let's talk about that. And then through that conversation, everyone realizes we can do many more things. Right. If you try to explain everything at once, it's, uh, it becomes too complicated. Right. Because people want exactly what you said. We've been trained and the industry trains itself to go, he's an ad man, right. he's a logo guy, he's a type person, he makes buildings. And actually the truth is that the best designers, not only the best designers, but many great designers can move across areas. People can think across many areas, right. but the industry doesn't really accept that. It leaves me wondering, uh, what happens to the old construct of what we've seen as a network agency, say uh, an IPG? company or a WPP company. It's very controversial. What happens to this? Of course it is, but I think it's something that they need to worry about if, and I see work like well, this. They are worried about it. Yeah, sure. They're very worried about it. Um, I, I, you know, for, for 15 years, I would say to you, I don't understand why you need a network uh, because I'm looking at it from my point of view. What I'm hearing now is clients telling me we don't need a network. The, the story about scale, having a workforce always on the payroll who can spin stuff up, adaptation, all that kind of stuff. 
you don't need that shape of business to be able to deliver those things anymore. And the really interesting thinking and the, 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 the dynamic creative work, I don't think we're seeing coming out of those big agencies. It's happening in two-man shops, 20-man, 50-man, whatever. Um, young people from outside the industry as well who haven't necessarily come through a traditional path. So there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of change going on there and I, I do think the networks are, are aware of it, but what they're doing about it, I'm not sure. Uh, another thing that strikes me is you know, the big change in, in you as a solution provider versus a, a traditional network agency as a solution provider is everything was black and white and measurable in terms of remuneration. You know? So you knew you had to pay so much for a radio spot, so much for a film, or so much for a print ad. In your case, I saw the Stella McCartney work. How do you even begin to tell your client yeah. you know, how much you're going to charge and then how do you justify the charges? Yeah. How do they buy it? I mean, we're not, we've never been in, a, in, in, in the media side of communications, nor actually the, very much in the communications business itself. So it's never been as structured as that. But typically, in, in the, in, what happens in our business is that every different type of work we do is commercially also somewhat varied. So if you're doing a branding piece, um, you, you would usually set a project fee around that. People do do retainers in our space, but not in the same way as it's the norm in advertising. It happens a lot, but not as much as it would in advertising. We never do retainers. It's an active decision. So commercially, we don't think that's smart because it, you know, it breeds familiarity too much. And I think the work and the requests become more low level. We're at our best when we're revving very high, doing the most difficult work that's most creative. When we come down to this level, it doesn't work very well. Right. Um, but then, to answer your question on another level, when you start working with startups and you start backing yourself on some things, the commercial conversation gets much bigger and much more varied. So you start getting into things like performance-related fees uh, based on very measurable things. Not measurable in terms of how many likes did I get, but measurable in terms of did my business grow? Did we get funding? How many customers did we acquire? Um, how successful do people think the brand is? Like really real things. Um, and then you get into some really interesting conversations about equity, um, some sort of bonus type payments and things like that as well. So I would say that the commercial thing is, is exploding as well. Like what type of company you need to work with as a client and how you can pay them. There's many more options on the table than they were in the past. But one of the things network agencies are grappling with today is this, this uh, monster called procurement. Oh yeah. Yeah. So uh, you're suggesting to me that you don't have any many conversations with procurement. Do I understand that yeah, right? Yeah, we do have conversations with procurement, but without wanting to be flippant about it, I mean that's a that's getting you're getting into the confirmation zone there. Really, you're not. Right. That's not where you negotiate. That's where you finalise in, right. in our business. We we discuss. We tend to be working with people who are either owners of businesses uh, or leaders of businesses. So. It's not that they have huge budgets, they don't waste money in any way at all, but they have a, they're looking across the company and therefore they, they would help to um, identify whether something's a priority uh, or not and maybe they can move the budgets around in a way that someone in procurement is tasked with a very different job, which is to say, how can I shave 5, 10, 15% off, off of this over the, over the lifespan, right? So, Learning how to do procurement well is obviously important, but I don't think that's where you're going to do the most interesting work if you stick in that conversation. Right. You even uh, take an agency like BBH, yep. which was fiercely independent once upon a time, and one fine morning they woke up and they decided they wanted to sell. Yeah. Uh, you're 30, mid 30s, I guess, and so what happened? When, do you think you reach that stage where you, know, <laughs> you say, okay, now I want to make some money, real money? <laughs> Does that happen? Uh, do you think Maybe, it could I, I don't know, like you say, I'm, 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 I'm still really young, <laughs> so <laughs> I've got so much time. Right. But uh, I'm not massively motivated by money, personally. Right. Um, I, uh, I'm certainly not anti-money. I work in a capitalist uh, economy and I do work for corporations for money and I think it's valuable, it's important stuff. But um, personal wealth is, is a separate question. All of the guys who founded the business are, have a very similar value system in relation to money. We're 
more interested in the work than we are in the money. It's very important for us that we make money, enough money that we can do what we want to do with the company. Right. Um, but that's not about taking the money out and putting right. it into our pockets. We have and continue to invest a lot of money back into into the business because it's it's it's, it's an important part of our lives, right? Sure. As for another question, you know, you made another point there, which is interesting, which is the amount of money that these guys pay. There's two problems. I, I don't actually think they necessarily pay it as well as people assume. Um, and also, none of the groups um, have an, an, a space uh, that would that really understands design. And of course, we do other things than design, but design is a big part of our, our work. And I, I honestly don't believe they would be able to understand how to work with it. So the last question, I'm provoked by something you said just now, which is uh, you spoke about the founders having common value systems. Yeah. So when, in your whole recruit recruitment process, how important is alignment to what you stand for? It, it, how do you check that out and how important is it? It's, it's, it's really important, uh, but we don't have a checklist, really? <laughs> which maybe is a problem. Uh, maybe we do need to make a checklist, but um, we, we tend to uh, you know, talk to people a few times before they join. It's not, not often very snap decisions. And we look to hire people for longer periods of, of time which I think makes you think about it more carefully anyway, rather than, well, come in for a week and get a job done. It's like, well, there's a bit of work which is a couple of weeks, but we want to hire you, we want someone who we might want to continue working with for years. I, I think the value system is actually almost one of the most important things. You can have extremely talented, technically gifted people who don't want to be part of whatever that thing is, and it won't work. In the same way, you can have people who are very strong, but not necessarily the best uh, in the world at what they do, um, but really do something that's hard to define that helps the team work even better. And that's, you know, it's a cliche, but that's how teams work. Not everyone is a hero, and people change roles, and, and it's fine. Thank you so much for a wonderful conversation. Not Thank you. Thank you for the great questions. Let's take a break here. Coming up ahead, Natasha Jain from Design Powerhouse Pentagram. Welcome back. You're watching Storyboard. A star highlight at the Curious Design Yatra this year was Natasha Jen, who serves as one of the 19 partners at the world's largest independent design consultancy, Pentagram. Known for her media-diverse work for brands including Nike, Target and MIT, amongst others, Natasha spoke about the price of creativity, addressing complex questions such as the value of a designer, the benefits of pro bono work and the importance of money as a motivator. Here's that conversation. Natasha, welcome to Storyboard. I first want to ask you this. You spoke about the price of creativity. Uh, do you think that designers are underpaid or are they undervalued? Well, in general, designers are underpaid, you know, regardless of uh, industries from architecture to graphic design to fashion, so on and so forth. It's a different thing when it's in advertising, when mm -hmm. marketing is involved. Typically, advertising um, is paid much better because it's a kind of different economy, mm -hmm. uh, different uh, market system. Um, but in general, yes, I think designers are underpaid, you know. Um, it doesn't matter if you're position or you know the size of the studio but it's a kind of common condition and I think that I'm not sure um, under value is a kind of good way to to try to understand it but I think that it has a lot to do with the nature of capitalism mm -hmm. which uh, is the notion of how can we get the most out of it while paying mm -hmm. um, as little as possible. You see that in other industries as well. It's not particular to just design. I think that you know it's a kind of uh, uh, system that we're all experiencing right now. Do uh, you think it's probably because the people who you are selling your ideas or designs to, your clients, don't really see much economic value in it? They, they look at it as a cost and not as an investment. I cannot generalize clients okay. you know with one statement mm -hmm. but I think that when clients come to us come to um, Pentagram they automatically automatically already I think see the value of design otherwise mm -hmm. they could just go to um, 
anyone, right? But they know that, okay, Pentagram, it may not be uh, the most economic choice, it may not be the cheapest, yeah. but they do see value in what it gets, you know? And I think that there has to be that kind of uh, trust, that kind of belief as a kind of prerequisite for a project in order to be successful. But I cannot actually generalize yeah. all clients. Why do you think the design industry and across, um, you know, like you said, architecture, fashion, um, advertising, why do you think you've allowed yourself to be in a place where you are underpaid? Historically, it has always been like that. I think that there definitely needs some research, right? Some serious research, I think, across timeline, across regions, across different cultures to kind of understand why we're at where we are right now. But I think that this is not a kind of day one situation. Yeah, this doesn't happen just yesterday. It has always kind of been the case. I think that I would be curious to know what is the actual reason or, you know, what are the factors um, behind this, you know? And I think that, again, it has also a lot to do with different cultures, with the kind of, you know, political system as well. For example, you will find that designers in Europe, they don't necessarily get paid more in terms of dollar amount, but they have, ten, again, I'm generalizing, they, they tend to have better quality of life. Okay. Why is that? There is a great social welfare system there that can actually support them. There's actually a lot of cultural institutions giving out grants, for example. So they can actually apply for grants as long as they have meaningful projects. You don't get such opportunities as much, say, in America. In America, you gotta work, okay? So that's a kind of very different political and uh, cultural system. And I'm sure that India is probably its own thing, you know? So I think that it's too, it would be too simplified to say, mm -hmm. okay, why are we why kind of are? underpay right now? Because I think that the, the answers are actually pretty more complex mm -hmm. than, than, than that. What is the payoff of uh, taking up a project uh, pro bono? Well, um, different people do it for different reasons, you know. For example, um, some people see it as an opportunity to give back to the world so that they would take on nonprofit organizations to help them, which we do a lot. And for, for me, for ourselves, oftentimes, not always, but oftentimes, the reason is always that there's some opportunity that mm -hmm. I see. Not opportunity in a kind of monetary Money, yeah. sense, but opportunity in terms of uh, creativity that I see the project can actually allow us to be creative and to be inventive in some way. And I will actually take those opportunities or rather I sometimes even pursue those opportunities because I think that um, they're quite important for us to stay mentally energized and you know to have a diversity different challenges so on and so forth. You also said that uh, you know an outcome is often unpredictable if the outcome is unpredictable then how do you deal with the ownership factor who owns uh, uh, the design and the product finally? Well in our contract, I think that, you know, we got to a point where we're professionalized enough yeah. to actually make such a statement in the, in the contract that if the project is, say, canceled for whatever reason, mm -hmm. is not finished, we actually own the creative okay. rights of the project, meaning that they cannot actually take it and use it. But, you know, I have to say, people are people. People are not always uh, following the <laughs> rules. So when you see um, certain cases where you feel like, oh, they kind of broke the rules that we agree, what do you do? You know, do you sue them or do you just kind of let it go? I think that's a kind of case by case. But what uh, do you do in the case where, you know, you showed us the example of um, the, the Legos and the icons uh, on, on the screen. So then you said that they didn't finally take that up, but you saw uh, traces of your work and your design in the final outcome. I let it go. That's so. That's totally okay. You know, um, we know that we did it. And you see, designers recycle. Mm. We borrow. We recycle. We repurpose other designers' ideas all the time. And it's very hard to say that. Oh, who who has the total creative ownership, right? But I think that as long as we know that we're being honest about things, and then we kind of stick to. Uh, what we do and we, we're creative 
that's totally fine. Okay. What role would you say remuneration p p uh, plays in inspiring designers? I have to say, you know, people say, oh, money doesn't make you happy, which I really believe that. Which you, you said know. so but, also. But then, right, but then I have to say, you will not be happy without money. Mm -hmm. that, that, that's a kind of, you know, conundrum that we're facing right now because ultimately we all want quality of life, right? So people get motivated by good fees, high mm -hmm. fees, by good salaries. Of course, that is okay. But what I'm saying is that you have to kind of weigh your priority, <laughs> right? I think that it's never a kind of cut and dry uh, answer. You kind of have to weigh, always constant, constantly question yourself, is this worth it? Should I actually make certain changes here? Okay, I would say, go try something else. Worst thing is that if it doesn't work out, you can always come back. There's really nothing to lose, you know, mm -hmm. um, in trying. So I think that, okay, we're also constantly struggling with, you know, um, finance, profit, creativity, happiness, and all that, you know. So it's a kind of daily question. But I think that keep it fluid, you know. That's all the time we have on the show today. Stay connected. We're on Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, and there's also the brand's page at firstbiz.com. Until next week, thanks for watching.